Today we're in part six. Now we've got a lot of things to cover today. Uh, we've talked about uh, soil and weather and all that good stuff. Today we're going to get down and dirty and we're going to actually plant a tomato plant and we're going to talk about that a little bit and we're going to talk about seeds and uh, catalogs and where you can find seeds. Um, the first thing we have up here are a couple of examples of seed packages. There are a lot of good information on seed packages. Basically, there's a couple of things you want to look carefully at them for. Uh, you'll notice on the right hand side on the bottom of the screen there, there is a uh, seed package that says a packed for by date. This is somewhat important. If you're buying seeds at the store, you want to make sure they're fresh and new. And so that is what your packed for date will say. It doesn't mean you can't use old seeds. Many times seeds will last for years and years and years. Uh, so basically it, it, can be, it can be an old seed if you like. Uh, sometimes I use seeds that are a year old. I've used seeds that are five years old. So uh, here's another picture of a seed packet. Um, we have a description on our seed packets. Sometimes you'll get the botanical name of the plant, which may or may not be important to you. You'll certainly get the common name and what variety, uh, which would be important for a vegetable. Uh, there's a quantity of seed. Quantity of seed is hard to talk about because seeds are different sizes, so therefore they weigh different amounts. Um, I don't pay too much attention to that. Some catalogs will tell you this particular seed at this weight will plant X number of feet of garden row. Uh, but you don't usually get that on seed packets. And of course, there's uh, very often something that talks about whether the seed is a heirloom or if it's a hybrid of some type. Uh, and uh, you can see on the about the left middle section of your screen, this uh, seed packet also talks about maturity date, which is very important for you to consider when you're planting your garden. This is just an example of three different seed packets. They all show you the same information. Uh, and basically, People differ as to how they like to see things. On the far left, it's kind of pictorial, and a lot of people like that. Uh, in the middle, it's very much text, uh, and some people like that too. So whatever type of packet you pick up, they basically will have that same information. It might just be in a different format. And some seed packets, not many, but some, will have things on the inside of the packet. It might be things like recipes, uh, some additional cultural information, where the plant uh, originated uh, in the world, things like that. Uh, so if you have a seed packet that has stuff on the inside, you will probably find some interesting things in there to read. Plant tags are very similar. Um, they have less information, of course, because it's a smaller space. But they'll at least have something, the name of the plant, uh, particularly the common name. Some of the plants you'll see on the far right of your screen, they'll have that, that little square that your computer or your phone, rather, can uh, photograph and actually read for additional cultural information. So uh, those are nice, too. Tags don't generally give you as much information as uh, the packets do. Oh, catalogs. It's just wonderful to get catalogs, uh, especially in the early spring. And the good thing is, these puppies are available to you free, <laughs> just for the asking. So you can go ahead and uh, ask for uh, one of these catalogs. You can call them. You can be on the internet and just put in your uh, address and uh, they will send them to you as quickly as they can and they'll be very happy to send them to you. Catalogs have a lot of information. Some catalogs 
actually rival books with the information that you can get out of them. So definitely, um, we will look at some of those. The, some, now, catalogs vary a little bit, but most of them uh, will give you some pretty good information. You'll see on the top left of your screen here that uh, there's general cultural information about tomatoes in general uh, in this particular catalog. So that, that could be very interesting to you. Uh, it might tell you whether you do or do not want to grow this plant because sometimes plants require more care than we really want to give them. And so you might find that out in this particular uh, area of this catalog. Now, we're looking a little further down the page in this catalog. On the right-hand side, you see that there are three different types of tomatoes listed. Uh, and on the left-hand side, there's something called a resistance key. Now, you can see in this key that there are, I've circled certain things. And these are things like LB is late blight. Uh, and you can see down here in the third, um, in the third little tomato, which is a hybrid, he is resistant to late blight. Uh, he's also resistant to nematodes, and um, he has high resistance to these uh, particular items, one a disease and one an insect. And he also has high resistance to the disease of uh, verriculum wilt. Now you notice the two upper tomatoes, the Cherokee purple and Prudence purple. These are both marked as heirlooms. And they don't have any of that uh, disease-resistant information. Doesn't mean that they aren't, but they don't actually list it. Whereas the hybrid on the, the third one, uh, that one uh, has been bred for resistance to those particular things. And this can be important to you because it lets you know what you need to watch out for in the garden. Are there particular diseases uh, of, of a tomato or particular insects that might attack that plant that you will have to depend, defend that plant from? Catalogs have other interesting things. They might have a little bit about the growers. Uh, sometimes it's interesting to know their particular philosophy, if they're an organic grower or a non-organic grower. Um, in the center, there's a planting chart. Uh, this can be very handy for you. It gives things like uh, what temperature for your particular crop, high and low, uh, all kinds of good things like that. Um, and on the far left, it just has some general gardening basics. So catalogs will have things like this in them also. What in the world are F1 hybrids? You'll see this a lot uh, on plant labels and in catalogs. Basically, F1 means literally first children. So they have taken two tomato plants, cross-pollinated them, and the resulting children are the F1 generation. Now you can have uh, F2 and F3 and F4 generations, but generally what you will see for sale is the F1 generation. Uh, why? Well, uh, generally the F1 generation is bred for desistant, resistance to particular things, like diseases uh, or particular insects. Also, there's something called hybrid vigor. And for some reason, uh, in this, I've seen this in dogs and cats and everything else, um, that first generation just for some reason seems to be much more robust. Uh, and this can be a, a gift to you because it means the plant's going to grow and produce better and also uh, be more resistant to various uh, insects and diseases. It can be a more expensive plant because, of course, the grower has hand pollinated these plants. Uh, they've gone through some trials to make sure that the, the genetics of the plant are stable. Uh, and, you know, they, they can be a, a stronger plant. Um, 
they're not useful to you if you are saving seeds. Now you might grow the plants, but the seeds from this F1 generation are going to run the whole gamut from uh, both parents genetically. So what you get from those particular hybrid seeds may not be anything like the plant that you originally grew. Uh, and so that's why we do not save hybrid seeds. Now, hybrid seeds can be planted, and who knows, if you plant a hundred of them, you may discover the next new plant uh, hybrid that will hit the market and be a great success. That's how these hybrids are developed. They cross-pollinate parents, plant thousands of them, and find maybe the one or two plants that are superior in all things. So uh, it doesn't mean you can't plant the hybrid seeds. Uh, a few of them uh, may be sterile, but most of them will germinate. But don't expect to get out of them what you actually planted, uh, what the parents are. You'll also see something called VN or VFNT. And this is uh, you'll see down the right side of your screen there, uh, you'll, you'll see these most often in tomatoes and other vegetable plants. Ver Verticillium wilt is V, uh, Fusarium wilt uh, is F, nematodes, we talked uh, quite a while back about those nematodes that eat roots, uh, and those are the ones we're referring to, and T of course is tobacco uh, mosaic virus. These are common diseases in tomatoes. Um, and if you have a plant that is resistant to all of these, you're ahead of the game. You're, you're probably not going to be bothered by those diseases. So, but these diseases can also appear in some flowers and other plants also. But uh, definitely if you're buying uh, tomatoes and they're not heirlooms, um, Look for this uh, VFNT label on the plant. Now, speaking of heirlooms, that doesn't mean that an heirloom is not resistant to one or more of these particular diseases. They can be and are, in fact. However, um, they don't generally put that on the plant label. Uh, you might find it in a catalog, uh, because after all, these heirlooms they are the parents of our hybrid plants. So yes, uh, some of them will have uh, that resistance to uh, some of the diseases. OK, watering. How much? How? You can water with a hose. That's just fine. Uh, many people enjoy taking the hose out to their vegetable garden and watering it uh, by hand. That's a very good time to go ahead and look uh, at your plants to see what insects or what pollinators are around, what uh, enemies of the garden are around, uh, and just how the plants are growing in general. So that, that's a very good time to do that uh, if you're hand watering. Some people like to use sprinklers. That's fine. Uh, now, tomatoes in particular do not like to have their leaves wet. Uh, so if you're using some type of a sprinkler system to water your tomatoes, you're going to have to watch out for fungal diseases because um, that happens when you get the tomato leaves wet. Uh, so tomatoes are best watered from the ground. You might have a garden with uh, rows down it, like on the top right there, and you can flood the little uh, areas between the rows. That's kind of the old-fashioned way. Oh, a, lot of, a lot of commercial crops are still watered that way. Uh, the big question, how much and how? Uh, well, that all depends on this list on, on, the, uh, on your screen here. The depth of your soil. Yeah, is it is it just a little bitsy, or is it a nice deep soil? Uh, maybe you have a uh, a raised bed garden, nice deep soil, but it does dry out a little faster than an in ground garden does. What kind of soil do you have? We have a lot of clay soil here, um, so if you're in an in ground gardener, you may have a lot of clay in your soil. 
Again, if you're in a raised bed, you probably don't. Clay soil, you'll recall from our earlier class, holds moisture. So uh, you will probably water that in-ground garden a little less than you would your raised, raised bed. Uh, what kind of plants you're growing? Every plant is different. Um, every variety of plant is different. So you need to know what that particular plant needs. We know that this little, uh, this little tomato plant here, he likes to have moisture. He doesn't like to dry out. Uh, so we're going to have to make sure that those soil conditions meet this plant's requirements. Uh, we also know that he likes a whole lot of sun. So again, that's going to have an effect on how quickly your soil will dry out. How long has it been since it last rained? Rain is, is a great uh, reservoir builder. Uh, when I go out to my garden and I put my moisture meter into the trees, the top couple inches might be fairly dry. But when I shove that moisture meter down further into the soil, about so deep, it's still very wet from all of our spring snows and rains. So um, definitely you're going to look at things like that. And again, if you're in a raised bed, you're probably not going to get that, that uh, deeper moisture because your raised bed is only uh, about so deep, depending on what kind of a bed you put in. Um, and do you have any mulch in your garden? Mulch is wonderful. Uh, it does a lot of different things, even for inorganic gardeners. Uh, it will keep the soil uh, moisture level uh, up better. Uh, and it will give a place for a lot of those little soil organisms to live and breed and have families and things like that. So how much water do you give your plant? Well, it depends. <laughs> Unfortunately, there is no pat answer that I can give people for how much water to give their plants. Uh, rule of thumb. When we get into the 80 and 90 degree days here, you can pretty much figure that you're going to water your vegetable garden and your container plants every day. Um, some of your landscape plants will not have that water requirement. But uh, your vegetable gardens will not make it through the summer here uh, without some additional irrigation uh, of some type. New plants, seedlings, things like that, they need uh, more water than a mature plant that has been in the ground for a couple of weeks. Uh, and again, know what your plant is and what its needs are. Uh, that's probably the most important thing uh, to make you a successful gardener is knowing what that plant needs. Uh, and every garden's different. Your garden is different from mine and from your neighbors. and. Uh, it's going to be an experimental thing for you. If you haven't gardened uh, there before or in a particular spot before, you're going to have to pay a little more attention. Uh, go out and check uh, daily on your plants and experiment a little bit. Uh, if you've got a moisture meter, definitely use that and uh, keep some records. It, it's, um, I didn't used to keep records. I, I admit I was very lazy about that. But I have started keeping records for the last couple of years, and it is amazing what I learn about my garden by going back and looking at last year's or the year before. Every year is different, but there are some consistencies. And so if you will keep some records of your garden, you will learn about what things are growing and how they're growing and things like that. There's some alternative watering methods. Olas are very popular nowadays. The problem with olas is that they are expensive <laughs> because, of course, they are the in thing. Um, there is an alternative to the ola, and that is an unfired clay pot. Now, these unfired clay pots are generally the cheapest ones that you can buy. So look for those. Buy two the same size, and you can see on the far left in the middle of your screen We've glued two of those pots together rim to rim. 
Now, the, the pot on the bottom with the hole, you're going to plug that hole. But you leave the top hole open. Then you take your pot, you bury it just about uh, with about so much of the top exposed uh, above the soil. And that top hole is where you're going to fill the pot with water, uh, just like you would an ola. Olas and unglazed uh, clay pots work by allowing the water to slowly diffuse out of their, their holding capacity into the soil around them. Now this means that you're going to have a minimum of one, and depending on the size of the plant and its needs, it might need two or even three of these olas or clay pots uh, buried around them. Uh, and you'll notice the ola in the middle top of the screen has a rock across the top of its hole. And you would definitely put a rock or a piece of board or something across that upper hole because this will prevent the water that's in your ola or your clay pots from uh, evaporating out the hole. You want it to diffuse into the soil around it. Uh, and if you're doing an ola or a clay pot, you need some type of a, a measurement device so that you can tell how much water is in there. An old chopstick, a piece of uh, thin board or bamboo will do just fine. So you can stick it down in there and see how much water is left in the ola or your clay pot. And this again is kind of experimental to decide you know, how often you're going to have to come back and fill those guys up. Might be once a day, might be once every three days. Uh, again, it all depends on the temperature and your soil and everything else. Uh, at the bottom of your screen, you can do some landscape catchment systems. And a catchment can be just, as, just a, a little inch or two inch depression in the soil. In one of my front gardens, I have an inch depression across the top because the garden is on a very slight slope. I put that uh, depression on the top. Any rainwater that comes flows into that depression. Now, the idea is not to stop the water. The idea is to slow it down so that it can infiltrate the soil. And that's really the best way to uh, capture rainwater in our climate up here. How do I know when my crop is ready? You can always taste it. <laughs> that, that's, that's kind of the supreme taste. Also in the catalogs and the books and even online, look at some of the pictures. Uh, does your plant uh, product look like that particular picture? Uh, and look at the days to maturity. If you have had a plant growing for 50 days, and it's got some fruit hanging off it, but the maturity date says 75, well, that fruit is probably not ready yet. Uh, this will vary a bit, again, with uh, location and microclimates, but definitely um, check the days to maturity, look at pictures, does your plant actually, does your fruit look like that, and taste it, see if it, uh, if you're pucker up and it doesn't taste very good, it's not ready. <laughs> so definitely, uh, you can do things like that. Uh, you can also, if you have a neighborhood gardener, go ahead and ask them, uh, you know, when, when is this ready on your property? Do you think mine looks OK? Uh, if you belong to, uh, or even if you don't, for that matter, belong to our community garden, uh, come down to the garden and ask. There are lots of gardeners down there that will be more than happy to talk to you about your plants. Uh, and uh, so that, that's probably about the, the best ways to decide if something is ripe. And as you go along, you'll gain experience, and pretty soon you will know if this is ripe or not. There's lots of different things that you can uh, do in growing and extending the season here. Uh, and as I always tell my husband, it's only money, <laughs> uh, which he hates to hear. But there are greenhouses, which can be pretty expensive. And we'll talk 
more about this subject later, but there are cold frames uh, and there are low tunnels, which is on the far right here, and there are high tunnels, which are kind of uh, in between uh, greenhouses and low tunnels. Uh, we have a high tunnel over at the White Mountain Community Garden. Uh, these can be expensive and uh, kits that you buy, or they can be uh, do-it-yourself projects, and they can be pretty cheap. Uh, you can see on the far right, this person has some, uh, some frost cloth going over some low uh, arches in a tunnel. Uh, a low tunnel, and this is very good. Um, you could also use those same little arches for shade cloth because lettuce likes a little shade uh, during the summer. It's a very good cold crop here, but if you're going to grow lettuce in the summer, you're probably going to want to use uh, some shade cloth. And there are some other things we can do to extend our season kind of do-it-yourself items. In the upper right, you'll see what looks like a tomato plant buried in the soil with a board over the top. This is how we used to grow tomatoes in Iowa. I would dig a hole, for instance, my little tomato plant here. I would dig a hole about yay deep. I'd plant him in the bottom. And at night, I'd go out and I'd kick a board over the top of the hole. OK, the surrounding soil and everything protected and held heat. So that little tomato could start growing a lot earlier than if I just planted him out in the garden. And as he grows, I would fill in the hole so that, again, uh, we would get lots of extra roots out there. You could use a, a pot, a uh, clay pot also, as a, uh, as a protector from heat. You can cut the bottoms out of uh, great big jugs. Uh, and things like that to, to protect your tomatoes. And you can buy, if you like, what they call hot caps. So there's lots of things we can do to extend our season. So that's uh, about it for this part. Thank you for tuning in.